On the right, Lloyd Smith. On the left, Philip Britt. And I'm Barry Acock, your host. We're in the arena. Before we dive into the election, Philip and Lloyd are going to dive into the Electoral College, give a little history. We always like starting the show off in the arena with a little background of history. I know a lot of the viewers out there have really appreciated it and liked it, so we're going to give you a little history of the Electoral College. Philip, give us a little background of that. Absolutely. Thanks, Barry. Um, the, the Electoral College was, was, has been part of our system of electing a president uh, since the Constitution was drafted. Uh, it, was a, it was a compromise uh, between basically three schools of thought. One, that the, the president should be elected by uh, the popular vote. So anybody that voted uh, was eligible to vote, which is basically um, people who own property for the most part. Um, those folks should directly elect the president. The second idea was that it should be uh, the Congress should elect the president to select the president and that person would be the leader. Um, similar to the way the prime ministers are selected in some countries now, even now. Um, the third option that was suggested was that the state legislatures should select the president. Uh, nobody could, was satisfied with either of those, those ideas. Um, in fact, the, uh, they really didn't like the idea of, of popular vote uh, electing the president. Uh, in fact, they, uh, one, of, one of the delegates from Virginia, George Mason, uh, compared allowing the populace to directly elect the president to having a blind man judge colors. And so, you know, obviously they didn't, he didn't have much faith in the electorate at that time. Uh, and the other thing was that, that it was, the, the nation was pretty spread out for that day. Obviously nothing like this today, but it was pretty spread out and information didn't travel the way it does now, obviously. And so they were concerned that, that people, when they were electing, would not be able to get, or when they were voting, would not be able to get enough information about each individual person. They didn't like the idea, some people didn't like the idea of Congress doing it because basically they thought Congress would probably, uh, we had this idea of checks and balances between the different branches of government and Congress would select a, a weak president so that they could kind of maneuver that person or that the president would feel obliged to Congress and would feel like they had, they owed something to Congress and would kind of give in and delegate some of their own authority to Congress. Um, in the state legislatures, there was some concern that um, the, that any, any body, whether it was the state legislatures or Congress, um, would have the possibility of being influenced by outside influences. Their real concern was foreign countries or, or people from foreign areas coming in and either, either by money or influence or some way um, having undue influence on who, on who they selected as president. And so they put together, uh, they, they couldn't decide. They couldn't come up with a, with a, a way of choosing. And so they put together a, a committee of 11 to me, maybe the best name I've ever heard for a committee, uh, and I think I wanna, wanna put this in, in any group that I work with from now on, I wanna have this committee. It's called the Grand Committee on Postponed Questions. <laughs> and is that not great? I mean, because we, we put off things and you're like, oh, let's have one committee that looks at all the stuff we <laughs> couldn't decide on. And so uh, they were charged with resolving all the unfinished business, including the how to elect a president. There's really no one who knows at this point, it wasn't recorded as to who came up with the idea of this electoral college, um, but it kind of eliminated their concern about uh, a body being influenced by outsiders because literally they met one time uh, and those people supposedly they hoped would be um, 
uh, knowledgeable enough of each of the individual uh, people running for, for president to make a choice that was legitimate. They gave no direction to the states as to how they selected their electors or how they, you know, whether they, you know, if somebody, as today, if someone wins the state, even wins 50% plus one vote, they get all the, all the electoral votes with the exception of two states. And, um, but they came to that compromise. Uh, it satisfied some of the states with, um, that, that were, um, that were concerned that uh, more populous states would have an advantage. Um, and, you know, and, and Virginia did have an advantage, although Virginia was satisfied with, the, with this. They, they ended up with uh, several presidents right away that came out of Virginia. Um, the South was, a, was really uh, against the popular vote, but they ended up satisfied. Everyone was satisfied with at least, it wasn't the perfect, um, Choice, but it was, it was, a, it was better than any of the alternatives for everyone. And, and they decided that uh, what they had to do was get the Constitution ratified. And the only way they could get that done was to have something in place that would at least satisfy people. Um, whether they thought it was going to continue for 240 years, I don't know. Um, maybe so. Maybe they felt like it would. Um, a couple things that are interesting to me about the way the Electoral College works today. And again, I'm not. I'm not suggesting anything about this. These are just facts. Um, the way the Electoral College works is each, each state, and, and some people may not know this, each state is given the number of electors equal to their two senators, which every state has two senators, and number of Congress people. So, um, for example, Missouri has eight Congress people and two senators, and so we have therefore 10 electors. Um, Alaska, for example, has one congressperson and two senators, so they have three. Um, up to a certain point of population, everybody has at least one congressperson. So you may have a significantly lower number of, of population, um, but you still have one congressperson because everybody has at least one. And so it can make some people's votes worth a little bit more than others. Um, and again, this is just a, here, here's where I, I kind of looked at it just to kind of give an idea. Um, Wyoming is the, one, is the state with the uh, lowest number of registered voters. And that's what I kind of looked at because, you know, California's got, got um, you know, California has 39, almost 40 million people that live in California that are residents, but only 22 million actual registered voters, because a lot of folks that live in California aren't citizens, they're not residents, they don't register to vote, whatever the reason, um, just a little over half the people that, that live there can, are registered voters. Whereas Michigan has a huge number, uh, almost 80%, over 80% of their people that live there are registered voters. Now, some of that has to do with an older population, uh, fewer children and younger people maybe, um, but a lot of it has to do with just being registered to vote. And so Michigan has one elector for every 507,000 registered voters. Wyoming has one elector for every 89,000 voters. So it's really interesting to see, you know, Wyoming mm -hmm. gets three electoral votes, but they have only 89,000 people that are registered to vote compared to, the, to those electors. So that's pretty amazing to me. It, it's, you know, and every state's different because every state has a different number of registered voters, population. Um, it's as fair as it can be from the way our system is set up. Um, and, but I just thought it was interesting to look at the numbers and kind of see how they, how they play out. It's very interesting. So, yeah. What, well, Lloyd, Democrats have won the popular vote, I think, as of today, seven out of eight election cycles now. Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton and Al Gore probably would say, let's, let's just go by the popular vote, right? Sure. So, yeah. you know, it looks like to me the Electoral College favors the Republicans in the last eight cycles at least. Mm -hmm. So what's really fair? Because that's what we really need to be is fair to both sides, right? What is fair in your opinion? Well, you know, I think, you know, a fair sometimes is in the mind of the beholder. You know, <laughs> that's true. And I, I think most of our states, uh, certainly in flyover America, would prefer to keep the Electoral College. Uh, it's, they feel like that they get the kind of attention they need. 
you would never get that many people going in and out of Iowa for certain if uh, the electoral college was eliminated. And I think uh, because of that, it's gonna, it would be very difficult to change and take two thirds of a vote in both bodies and in three quarters, mm -hmm. quarters of the states to ratify a constitutional change. So I think we're gonna live with the electoral college, uh, you know, whether it's the Biden race this year with Trump or whether it's those other races, uh, they've pretty well figured out how to uh, dance with the system that mm -hmm. uh, brought them. And uh, I think that's what they're gonna keep doing. Uh, you know, I can understand if you're in California or New York that you feel like you're not getting a quote fair shake, but uh, you know, you're, you're getting an awful lot of uh, votes in the electoral college. Yes. So I, I think uh, it's gonna be there for a while. Yeah. You know, well, the interesting thing is in, in California, um, for registered voters, their electoral votes, they get more electoral votes per, uh, per capita than Missouri does. Because Missouri gets one elector for every 421,000 people, and California gets one for every 400,000 people. Well, you're just looking, though, at, at registered voters. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. So it, it, and, I, and, and, and electors are, are basically based upon defined population. on population. Exactly. So. There's exactly. too many numbers floating around here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get away from the math. So, so what, do we, what do you think about the, uh, the difference? That, you know, there are two states that do it differently. There are two states mm -hmm. that assign uh, their two electors that are... Uh, that essentially represent their senators to their statewide vote, mm -hmm. uh, and then they assign uh, their other electors to uh, their congressional districts. So um, what would you think about that? I mean, Nebraska does that and Maine does that. Normally it wouldn't make a difference, but I know President Obama won the second congressional mm -hmm. district in Nebraska. It appears that Vice President Biden has won the second district in Nebraska. I didn't think Trump would win the second district in Maine, but he, I think he's pulled it off. Yeah. So, you know, that, that kind of messes the electoral math up because with those two electors, you could get a 269 to 269 vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Lloyd, as we were talking, yeah. big dummies like me thought, <laughs> well, if it's tied, the House of Representatives would pick the president. And I was like, well, the Democrats will pick Biden, surely. But I found out last night, what, Lloyd? that each state has one vote in the scenario you described where the electoral college is 50-50 split and each state uh, gets basically one vote. So you got 50 votes and actually uh, in that scenario that you described, the Republican would win uh, based upon where we are today. Right. So. I know election night, that one electoral vote in Nebraska's second district looked like it was going to be very, very important. Could have been pivotal. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right. So I don't know if it's right or wrong. Do we need to make it more uniform? I don't know. Makes it interesting though, doesn't it? It does. It does. And, uh, and I think electoral college is something that probably is not taught that well in our schools right. and probably ought to be a, a whole civics lesson in that and, and uh, some of the other classes to understand why it's there. And some of that uh, background that uh, we didn't even talk about needs right. to be discussed as well. Sure. It, it was true. a great story. Yeah. Now we're going to get into our analysis of the statewide races, some of them just state senate races. I'm going to talk about them in general. We've had a coin toss and I've picked myself first. <laughs> so I just want to give an overall overview of the statewide races, the local state senate races, the two or three that were close. But here's the problem, Democrats. Um, election day saw a big, big red wave in Missouri. And the problem with Democrats now is, and we need to address this as Democrats, I'm a Democrat, proud Democrat, and we need to address this. The rural, rural Missouri is not being spoken to by Democrats and it showed up big time in the election results. So I'm not gonna sit here and sugarcoat it and say we had a great day in Missouri. We had one of the worst days in our history. Now Lloyd, all of that wasn't because of the big red wave we had here in Missouri. A lot of it's because the Democratic, Democrats bench was very, very weak this time. Besides Nicole Galloway, nobody heard of any of our candidates. I didn't hear some of them until about two, three weeks before the election yeah. myself. Huh. So teamed with a weak bench, the Dem Democrats said, even the Nicole Galloway didn't have very high name recognition throughout the state. I think that was maybe a lack of resources or I don't know, maybe she spent, it, spent the resources wrong, but um, she's the only one that had any name ID. So teamed with the big red wave, the Republican brand really shined through on election day. I give you a lot of credit for that. You were there in the early stages of building that wave, but y'all's hard work has paid off for about 30 or 40 years now. Lloyd, <laughs> what do you think about my analysis? 
Well, uh, it's, been, it's been going on for at least the last 20 years, uh, even though there's been Democrat governors in that, in that period. I think what you're seeing is, is that rural Missouri understands what they want and they go for it. I think they've done a better job on the Republican side of recruiting candidates. Uh, you know, you can look down through our statewides, uh, you know, even though some of them changed from what they ran for in 16, but uh, Governor Parsons getting 57% of the vote, uh, Kehoe 58, Ashcroft 60, Fitzpatrick 59, Smith 59. You're looking at a, at a huge sweep. And when you have that and at the top of the ticket, the president was carrying the state with right at 56.8, 57. That's going to have a, a positive effect. But I think the bottom line is candidate recruitment and making sure you're, you're in tune with the people that you're trying to represent not just their values, but what are they looking for from state government? And how much do they want, or how little do they want? And I think if they focus on that, the, no matter which party you are, you can, you can run good candidates, but you've got to be ready. And I think this has been a pattern now uh, with the legislature since, I guess, early 2001, when we took control of the state Senate for the first time in four or five decades, and then in 2002, when we took control of the Missouri House, uh, what that also gave us, I think, as you built those majorities in the House and Senate, was a developing uh, bench for the future. And the, our bench was extremely strong, not because they just upped and went to Jeff City and signed up to run for something, mm -hmm. but because they'd kind of come up through the ranks and they understood what they needed to do and their value structure. They knew how to run campaigns. And when you get to that point, you can, you can start to win elections consistently year after year. So, Philip, I think Lloyd's agreeing with me right now on what I said. <laughs> well, and I think you're both right. I think that, you know, it, Lloyd points out that it started, uh, you know, when, when they took the majority, when the Republicans took the majority in the, the House and the Senate, but it started long before that. Um, when I interned for State Representative Larry Thomason in 1991, uh, there were, I believe, two or three, two, I guess, uh, Republican state house members from south of Cape, um, all the way as almost as far west as, as our district, our congressional district goes almost. Um, and when I left in, in 2002, uh, it was the opposite. Um, in fact, when I was my last term there, um, you know, I was, I was pretty much the only uh, Democrat left in, in the boot heel. Denny Meredith was still here, but he left before his term was up. And so I was pretty much the only one left. Um, now, we, we've elected a couple down here in the Boot Hill since then with Terry Swinger and, and Tom Todd back a few years ago. Uh, but other than those, there haven't been any, any um, Democrats that even, even put up a challenge for the most part. Um, and I mean, I, you give Lloyd credit for, for when he was the chair of the Republican Party, but Darn I Darn it. But I think it goes. I think it goes back farther than that. I it, think it, it does. I think it goes back to uh, to Bill and Joanne Emerson and the way they listened to people in Southeast Missouri, and and a lot of that came through through you, Lloyd. And and I'm not I'm not trying to build you up over there, but I've said that for years um, that that the machine, so to speak, it wasn't really a machine. What it was was uh, a lot of hard constituent work, um, and constituent work made the campaigning a whole lot easier. Um, and, and that's the reality of it. Now, what you just said about, you know, we mentioned last week, when we, or week before last, when we were doing our analysis of these, these undercard races, these other statewide races, that, uh, that only three governors in, since 1940 had been elected that hadn't held one of those undercard, what were those other statewide elected mm -hmm. races. Well, you know, every one of those people who are statewide elected officials right now served in the legislature with the exception of Ashcroft. Yeah. Every one of them served in the legislature, either in the House or the Senate or both. Um, and that's good proving ground. Yeah. I met some of them two weeks ago myself, right. and well, I, I also, usually know all the Democrats. It also goes back to, to us having elected, right now at least in the legislature, only folks that from Kansas City and St. Louis for the most part, um, with maybe an exception in, in Springfield and maybe one or so districts around Columbia. I mean, that's pretty much all that that the Democrats have right now in the legislature, and I think that I think that makes a huge 
difference. But we even lost that Deb. Le I thought Deb Lavender was a shoe in. The urban vote on election day, and they're still counting in some states. The urban vote is still what I predicted would beat Donald Trump. It, it has beat Donald Trump. But in, in Missouri, the urban vote stuck with him overall. Mm -hmm. I mean, it swept Deb Lavender. She was a state rep running for state senate. Mm -hmm. um, she's on the around the Kirkwood area. And Andrew Koenig, he was the incumbent state senator. Yep. I would have bet you money the day of the election he was going to get beat. But Donald Trump's coattails were even strong in the St. Louis suburbs. So uh, Deb got beat, and Wagner hung on to her seat. I thought that was a toss-up. Mm -hmm. Even though Donald Trump and Wagner weren't best friends, right. Donald Trump's coattails is what kept her in office. Well, I, I think that's part of it too, but I, I, something that we kind of we, we don't talk about, and you talked about the Emersons, it really helps if you're an incumbent, if you've done that job right and you've mm -hmm. treated people well. Right. You, you know, whether you, they're Democrats or Republicans, don't worry about it. Just try to be helpful. And if you'll do that, you can, you can pull some of those independents and right. people from the other side over your way. And, and, you know, if you think about it, I mean, Jay Nixon was, was a governor for eight years. Bob Holden was a governor for four years. I, I think uh, both of them came from a system whereby one had been the treasurer, one had been attorney general. I think they conducted themselves pretty well in the offices that they had held, right. and they used that as leverage. So our statewide ticket used that as leverage this sure. time. I think Ann Wagner used that as well uh, in the two state Senate races. I think they probably had done a pretty good job of staying in touch. Uh, Rowden, obviously from Columbia, right. uh, was is more of a moderate uh, Republican and in a, in a county that we continue to lose statewide, mm -hmm. but he did he did well. Right. He squeaked it out. Yes, he, he did. did. 30, 32, 3,100 votes or so. Well, and that, you know, a lot can be said for having a, your senator in leadership too. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, that some people may have gone to the polls and said, we can either have the guy that's the majority floor leader in the, in the Missouri Senate, or we can have a, a, a person that's in the minority it's a, a freshman in the minority. Which do we which do we want? Well, and you talked about it one day when you actually talked about there's X number of people in Columbia that work for the university sure. or have a connection to the university, mm -hmm. and they understand the political ramifications mm -hmm. of having right. someone that can carry your water in the legislature when it comes to funding. So uh, all of those things kind of enter in and are intertwined. Now we're going to analyze the presidential race. It's a weird dynamic in the presidential race this election cycle. There's so many different things that's happening with the pandemic going on. Still got uh, mail-in ballots coming in in Pennsylvania. Still counting them. Um, Lloyd, Phillip, I've never seen an election like this. I do think that some of the uh, legal maneuvering that's being done may be more beneficial than we think because during COVID we have found out that the inconsistency between the states in the way they do balloting, uh, mailing, uh, mailing to a voter list. Uh, every state is somewhat different. And I think that, that lends itself not for a lot of confidence in the ultimate decision of the voters. And I think those are some things that will be looked at. And maybe the, the legal minutia that we're going through will help highlight that. But I do think it wasn't a wave election in this sense. Uh, you know, the House of Representatives at the federal level was expecting to win 10 to 20 additional seats. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Pelosi yesterday took some heat from her own caucus as they looked and they saw that they've lost a, a net of six mm -hmm. and they could lose another four or five. Uh, the House will still be in control of the Democratic Party, but that was a significant hit mm -hmm. uh, that proves there wasn't a wave going across the country. It may have been the persona of Donald Trump and COVID, but it probably did not mean that all these people that got elected by narrowly on the Democratic side in the Congress are going to uh, implement the Biden-Bernie manifesto. Uh, I think uh, if they're looking at elections in 2022, they're going to think long and hard before they put a rubber stamp on the Biden uh, agenda. That's a good point, Lloyd. There's, like, like we talked about earlier, there's a lot of dynamics. I mean, the Democrats really screwed up the Senate races. We had the little scandal in North Carolina. The, the Democrat in North Carolina, Cunningham, was a shoe-in to win before he had that scandal. If he's listening, I want my money back. <laughs> but uh, 
Um, there's so many. If, if that happens, call Phil and I. I hope he's listening. <laughs> there's so many dynamics that happened during, during the election. I mean, the Democrats really had one of their worst nights in my head that I've ever had. As far as a nationwide election, they really screwed this up. Like I said, rural values, rural issues, Democrats have to wake up and smell the coffee when it comes to, to rural America because the map don't lie. It's red and the population's sparse in rural America, but as we've seen the last two election cycles, that's one thing that Donald Trump does is turn out rural voters. Philip, I'll quit rambling. Well, one of the things that I, I think is going to be interesting is that um, based upon my experience in the legislature, the narrower the margin of your majority, the more you have to work across party lines. And my belief is that creates better law because you require, you require a group of people toward the middle to help make those, to make those decisions that need to be made. Um, and you have to compromise and you have to, you can't just dictate what happens. And that makes a huge difference. Um, in the quality of legislation that comes out. If you control all three, the, the, both the House and the Senate and the, the governor's mansion or the governor's mansion or what the White House, you're going to, you're going to have a totally different dynamic. Um, and I think we're going to see that, um, we've already seen it to a certain degree, I believe, in the stock market because the stock market is it responds I believe to the fact that they know the Senate's going to still be in Republican hands and the White House is going to be in the pre in, in the Democratic hands and, and they know that nobody's going to be tinkering a whole lot with with how they do their business because they can't um, and I think there's a response to that uh, so I think better legislation will happen uh, I think that that they're going to have to work together I think the House and the Senate are going to have to work together the Senate's numbers are going to be clo the, the same or close to the same as they were before. Um, and it's just going to be a matter of, of no one has a mandate to govern at this point. All the networks talked about the blue mirage or the red mirage. Right. Nobody really knew what the red mirage or blue mirage was until it hit them in the face. Right. When President Trump had that big lead in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, it was a mirage election night. Yeah. Then all the mail-in ballots come in, the absentee ballots. Uh, these aren't votes that get generated after the election. These were legal votes that were generated yeah. on election day or before. Before, right. So, well, Barry, here's, I hope that they were all legal, but I, sure. I, some of these states where they, they, they jumped on the bandwagon post Labor Day mm -hmm. and they started doing mail-in ballots, uh, they'd never done that before. Their hands were a little bit tied. I know one thing, I've seen the voter rolls in the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And I'd put ours up against a lot of states, and we have we have anywhere from a 0 0.5 to a 1.5 percent wrong, either in the wrong precinct, or they move to another state, yep. and you mail to their old address. Mm -hmm. So I think I, again, I think the the legal machinations that some people will say shouldn't be done. I think analysis of what happened, how it happened, where the votes came from, are all those votes legitimate? is something that's probably good for the country to at least analyze, and then uh, we can look forward to the next election and learn from this one. Kind of like we can look at this pandemic and hopefully learn for the next one. <laughs> that's right. That's uh, and right. not to tie the pandemic and the election together, but the, but the pandemic drove a lot of decisions in mm -hmm. how people vote mm -hmm. uh, dramatically different than they'd ever done. A lot more people voted early. A lot more people used mail-in than ever done before because they didn't want to stand in line, they didn't right. want to be exposed. It was, uh, it, there was a lot of things going on other than just the policies out there. Right. There was an environment that changed how people voted. It's ironic to me that ev even in red counties, Joe Biden won a lot of the mail-in votes. Like in yeah. Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. the counties that were solid red, yeah. when the mail-in ballots come in, Biden really cut the lead in half in some of those red counties. Yeah. All the rural counties, Pennsylvania is a lot like Missouri as far as the Rural vote, rural vote versus the city and urban vote, but I will say one more time, suburbia, the suburban vote has made President Trump unemployed today, and um, I think he turned them off over the last four years, and I think that's the reason it was a referendum on the president. I don't think it was a referendum on Trumpism, it was a res referendum on President Trump himself. And Lloyd, that's a great question for you. Although President Trump turned off a lot of these voters, 
And I honestly think, I hope you'll tell me on camera, not off camera, I honestly think a lot of Republican office holders are glad to see Donald Trump leaving, but they want to hold on to that white, uneducated, non-college enthusiasm that he brought to the ballot. Is that true or false? Because I really, really, truly believe they're <laughs> I, tired of know, answering questions about President Trump every I, single day. I, I think uh, Republicans would have preferred a more congenial person at the helm. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pittsburgh uh, uh, Gazette, the Post Gazette, that editorial, the first time they had endorsed a Republican since 1972, they outlined all the things that they thought Trump did that were good. But then they also said uh, he was no Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, or Dwight Eisenhower, or uh, FDR. Okay. And I think that's, that's true. Now, could he have gotten elected in the first place if he hadn't have been what he was? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know that we could have beat Hillary Clinton in 2016 with anyone other than Donald Trump running the way he ran. You're exactly right. I don't think Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, or fill in the gap. I think Joe Biden's the only one that could have beat Donald this Trump. Yes. This term. He's the perfect guy for the perfect situation. And that perfect situation might be the pandemic. Could be anything, it, right? Yeah. It, it was unique. Yeah. I would like to look back at those maps. Uh, well, know, we don't want to, do we, Lloyd? Uh, Gary, <laughs> I, uh, Gary, <laughs> Gary Figgins is helping us out today. He's our producer today. Gary, can you put up those maps? Uh, let's start with Barry's. Oh, no, we're starting with mine. Look at that, 291. I did not put Georgia on there, and Georgia's the one that's still kind of questionable. Pennsylvania, Arizona. Pretty close. That's pretty close. So let's see what Barry's looks like. Let's don't. <laughs> oh, no, there's Lloyd's. Lloyd says uh, 284 for Trump. He yep. had Pennsylvania. And Michigan. Michigan, that's right. That's not too far off, though. Yeah. And, yeah. and Pennsylvania. And, and then there's Barry's with... Uh, Florida and North Carolina. To Barry's defense, um, just before we went on the air last time for that map, he said, take Georgia off my map. He's the That's only true. one of us who, who actually thought Georgia might be a possibility, but he ended up pulling off the map. He's kept Florida, though. I went from a genius to a goat. That's right. That's right. And that's a good point. It's a fine line between a landslide and a very close election, right? That's I mean, right. there's so you many know, races that were close. And we talked about that last time. There, yeah. were, there were basically four states that separated 335 from, yeah. from 284. For and in 2016, for sure. It's Absolutely. almost the, yeah. the opposite map on the, the numbers. The, the map. As, as far as the electoral numbers, yeah. yeah. That's right. And that's, I mean, you can look at all things in an election and say, well, he should have done this, he should have done that. Like when Pennsylvania got to 600,000 votes, I wasn't thinking about the red mirage. And I told my wife, I was like, he shouldn't have said that about the fracking in the debate. I was like, he's fixing to lose Pennsylvania, yeah. his home state, yeah. because he made that 10 second mistake, or as Republicans would call it, the truth. Yeah. He told the truth. <laughs> he made that mistake in the uh, debate and started talking bad about fracking. So I told my wife, I was like, he's fixing to lose his home state because he made that one, you know, you campaign for two years and you make a 10 second Blur. That's uh, it's a it's a dangerous business, and any more you know they can capture that and put it in the right ads. That's right. And uh, it goes all it goes everywhere almost instantly. It's not like it's, the old days when no. it took two or three days to make a commercial. That's you right. can make it in less than thirty minutes now. You know the election really didn't go like it was drawn up on the board. No. Didn't go like you thought. No. Didn't go like I thought. Everybody was wrong about the That's election. Right. That's right. The winner's probably going to be like who everybody thought it was, and the pundits did. But the map is really nothing like anybody. And, you, you and we, we had talked early in this process when I told you that post, polling now is totally out of whack. It's an extrapolation with a guess on top of a guess. Yeah. And at some point, uh, I think the big losers this year, other than uh, the American people, if they believe the polls, were the pollsters themselves. Yes, except I'll give credit to the, is it Trafalgar, yeah. the Republican poster? I mean, if you look at the margin of errors, he was pretty accurate. He lost yeah. Wisconsin and Michigan, yeah. but in, in the margin of error, he was right again. He picked it in 16, so I'll give credit to those guys at Trafalgar. But the rest of them, the 17-point <laughs> poll in Wisconsin, the 12-point <laughs> poll in uh, Michigan, yeah. I mean, <laughs> terrible. I mean, even Florida. I mean, yeah, they, you know, yep. I mean, they were out of whack in Florida. I thought, you know, I don't know that they've, they've got all the, all the cards there. But I will say, if there's a positive for the Republican Party coming out of this, uh, if the result ends up being what you said, 
I think the uh, Latino outreach was mm -hmm. super, and I, I'm going to be interested to see if it was value related or jobs related or, or what they were really thinking when they left the Hillary Clinton camp mm -hmm. and went to the Trump camp and they did that in four years. It'll be interesting to see what their thought process It's a big was. swing, you're right. It's, it's a huge it's, swing. There's so many uh, things to dissect yeah. like a month or two from yeah. now about Ooh. the demographics of the election. <laughs> With that being said, I want to thank Lloyd for being with us all season long. It's been a pleasure, a thrill, and honor to work with you. I've known you my whole life, but we never really got to talk. And, well, I, uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk politics once again. We disagree a lot, but we are friends. He's a good friend of mine now. He's a class act. Thank you. Thank you. Very. Philip, I've known you for a long time, but we've kind of got reacquainted lately, and I wanted yeah. to thank you for doing this show. It's kind of your idea. I like the name. Absolutely. And uh, you've done a great job kind of coordinating this show. Well, and thank you. You got Lloyd for us, so thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. That's, right. That's right. Enjoyed it. And we'll see you in four years in, on In the Arena, but not really. We'll be back sooner, I think. That's right. But thank you for joining us this season, and we'll be back.